Hello and welcome once again to The Blueprints. This is Canada's Conservative Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Schmale, Member of Parliament for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock, with new content for you every single Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We are not slowing down. We are not taking time off. We will fight back against that ever-moving liberal agenda. And with that, we have a great guest for you lined up today. And before I get to him, I just want to remind you to like, comment, subscribe, share this program. And together, we can do that pushback, as I mentioned earlier. And of course, if you can't listen to the entire program right this second, you can download it, listen to it on platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, you know it, it is out there. So without further delay, we're bringing back Adam Chambers, a member of parliament for Simcoe North. He's also the deputy shadow minister for finance, a great friend of the show, my next door neighbor. We're going to talk about a lot of kitchen table issues today. We're talking about inflation, the cost of living. Everything seems to get harder and harder under this liberal government. Not to mention that they're actually okay with high prices of gasoline. So Adam, thanks for coming back on. Great to be here with you, Jamie. All right. Inflation is almost at 8%. It's absolutely incredible. The finance minister, Christia Freeling, gets asked about that at a news conference, and she goes into talking points basically about how this must accelerate their investments, their so-called investments, into green energy. It's like they don't even care that the price of everyday items is driving people, many hardworking people, into almost poverty to trying to pay for the increases that are skyrocketing right across the supply chain. You're exactly right. It, it's another example of the government being behind the curve. You know, 12 months ago, they were telling people, don't worry, they were using the word, it's transitory. And yet every single month or quarter that there's another data point that kind of undercuts their entire narrative, they, they keep kind of saying, you know, don't worry, look at the inflation around the rest of the world. Now they're blaming inflation on the war in Ukraine, which no doubt has an impact on the price of goods. We're not disputing that. But inflation was at 30 year highs before the war started. And now we're at now we're at uh, the highest level since 1983. And interest rates at that period of time were significantly high uh, in order to bring down inflation. So uh, the government's behind the ball. Um, I asked a question in question period just six weeks ago about what the government is going to do as there were signs the growth in the economy was slowing. And the answer I got back was, we've had the strongest growth three to six months ago. Um, not forward looking, always looking rear view mirror. They're being caught uh, behind the curve once again. And I'm not sure they're prepared for the economic, uh, potential economic challenges that lie ahead. Well, you said a lot there and it's just to pick up on some of it. Like there's more money in the atmosphere right now. It's obviously worth less now because as you pointed out, we have uh, we have currency inflation because of the printing of almost $400 billion in currency. At the same time, the demand, which has increased the price of everyday essentials, uh, all hitting at the same time, not to mention that, what's the solution that the government has and the NDP have? Well, let's tax the oil and gas companies. Well, that's only going to drive the price up even higher. Like you're punishing a group, a business. Yes, they're in it to make money, but they've been trying to expand their footprint here in Canada for as long as I can remember, decades. And, and they're dealing with the brunt of it. And you can't just up production just on a snap of a finger. It doesn't happen that way. Well, there's a couple of things happening there. First, you know, the NDP is talking about excess profit taxes, uh, in particular in the oil and gas industry. I mean, where was the NDP talking about, thank, or were they thanking the oil and gas in, uh, industry for the last 10 years when they were having massive losses and they were keeping inflation and prices low for people? I mean, it really doesn't make sense. If you're going to go after them now, what, what about the flip side when things weren't going so well for that industry? I, don't, I haven't really seen them defending the industry over the last 10 years when they had some serious challenges. Uh, the second is for some reason, the answer to inflation, both uh, primarily from the NDP, but even some in the government caucus is to make government revenues bigger, is to grow the size of government. Well, the federal government's actually never made as much money as it's making right now. Every month, it's breaking records for the amount of revenue that it's bringing in. The federal government has more money than it knows what to do with, and I'm not sure that giving it even more money is going to solve the inflation problem. In fact, giving this government more money means inflation is likely to get worse because they're going to spend it. 
And that's what's driving one of the things that's driving inflation. We've talked about this before on this show. It's like the government's solution to the inflation crisis just to spend more. And they can find a way to spend their way out of this. It's like fighting cancer with more cancer. It it's, it's absolutely doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And, and the media is sadly very silent on this. I think there are real alternatives that we're proposing that just get overlooked because it can't make Justin Trudeau look bad. Well, uh, you raise an incredibly good point. There are some alternatives. I get that the government doesn't necessarily want to listen to uh, its main opposition party in the House of Commons. Uh, so let's use some other examples. Um, former Governor of Bank of Canada, Stephen Polo says, uh, or excuse me, uh, David Dodge, uh, he was quoted recently saying, look, in order to bring inflation down, we have to see um, prices for energy, in particular oil and fuel, also come down. Well, 60 cents of every liter that we pay in gasoline uh, charges is taxes that go to some level of government, whether it's federal, provincial, or municipal. Uh, in fact, in France, their central bank said one of the reasons that France's inflation rate is lower than most other areas in Europe is because they cut taxes on gasoline. And so we have to be a little bit creative. I mean, listen, uh, if the government is so ideologically wedded to a carbon tax, okay, fine. Why don't they then say, listen, if, if fuel is $1.50 a liter or $1.40 a liter, the carbon tax is this number of cents. But if it gets to $2 a liter, we don't need the carbon tax anymore. We're already actually have such a high price move up in gas. Anyone who can reduce their consumption is, and anyone who's continuing to consume is consuming because they have to. They have to drive to work. They have to pick up their kids from soccer practice. They have to drive that truck. Uh, to uh, to the job site or deliver goods. You know, some of these folks are independent truckers. Um, diesel has doubled in about 12 months or, or just a little bit more than that. So I, these are real challenges. I think the government has to be thinking a bit outside the box. I mean, their plan to fight inflation was just an announcement of things that was in the budget. Um, there's nothing new here for people. And the NDP is just, you know, continuing to criticize them but they're supporting every step of the way. Okay, a couple of things there. Um, you know, as you mentioned, yes, the government is pulling in more and more money than it ever has before, but yet we can't get a passport. Canadians can't get a passport. The airports are a disaster. Immigration departments backed up about 2 million files I saw. Veterans are still waiting in line for, for their benefits. And the list just goes on and on and on. At the same time, the plan to fix inflation is to spend more. So they're taking in more revenues. So they're just going to spend it on more government programs. They're just going to keep circulating all of that. But at the same time, they're actually putting more people into financial hardship by doing this. But the rich, the, the, the really wealthy in society, they barely notice it. They, they'll still fill up their cars. They, they might notice a blip. Maybe they already have the electric vehicles. But... At the same time, the ordinary, hardworking Canadians are getting punished. It's the invisible tax that are just hammering them one day after the next. You're exactly right. Uh, last week, when the Bank of Canada increased interest rates by one full percentage point, which was a significant raise, uh, you know, hadn't happened since I think 1998. Uh, so we're talking, you know, 20 plus years since this has happened. So inflation is very serious. The NDP came out and said, you know at an interest rate increase of 1%, you know, we're gonna be hurting people. Well, okay, yes, uh, people's costs will increase, but you know what hurts the vulnerable and low income people more? Higher inflation. We have to get inflation under control. That means the government has to get its spending under control. That means we, we will have to endure some higher interest uh, in, in the short term, interest rates in the short term to bring down uh, the, the level of inflation to get people's expectations back down. But I mean, this is a result of the government continuing to spend. The real challenge, and Jamie, I'd love to hear from you on this. When I talk to any business owners in Simcoe North, uh, and I also talked to some over in Brockville last week with our colleague, uh, Michael Barrett, they cannot find anyone 
to work. They want to grow. They want to grow their revenues, pay more taxes, hire more people. They can't find anyone. Well, guess what? Of, the, of all of the jobs created and recovered since the pandemic started, 85% of them are in the public sector. So this is crowding out jobs in the private sector so that we can add more jobs in the public sector. Look, they are great jobs. People do great work for the federal government. I feel for the people on the front lines, but when the private sector is looking to hire people and they can't find anyone, yet the federal government's growing at 10,000 people per year and still having a hard time doing essential services, you have to wonder, this is not economically sustainable. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. It was actually one of the things I wanted to talk about, the, the growth in the hiring in the public sector. A lot of job gains has been <laughs> into the bureaucracy. And I don't think the idea right now is we need more government. We don't need bigger government. That's actually slowing down the private sector growth. The more layers, the more red tape, the more regulation of the rules, which some of them in this pile of 10,000 a year are being hired are hired to do just that. Um, it, it's actually hampering our ability as a country, as a province, our provinces, our territories, to grow the economic activity we need to push our way through this. And But you just, one after the other, just pile on, pile on. It, it's deflating in some circumstances. Absolutely, especially when you think about, like, we'll just use an example that everyone can, uh, that resonates with everybody, tourism. We have certain, um, we have restaurants that are closed certain days of the week because they don't have people. We have motels and hotels that are not open fully. They've got floors that are shut because they don't have enough people to, uh, you know, uh, say, take care of the property and, and maintenance, et cetera. So that means in a time when tourism is supposed to be getting back up off it, on its feet, off of its knees, they're being held from recovering fully from the pandemic because they don't have enough people. I mean, this is potential economic growth that we are, that is disappearing forever. You know, every hotel room that goes unused uh, every night is, is money that can never be recovered, right? That is a perishable good that expires at the end of each day, as an example. And so uh, people are, business owners are, are frustrated because they can't find labor. They're having a hard time getting um, any help from government on this front, yet at the same time are seeing the size of government continuing to grow and the services are actually not keeping up with that growth. So it's a big problem. I really feel for uh, the small businesses out there that are kind of the lifeblood and engine of the actual economy and, and they're trying to grow, but they can't find the people. And so we need to figure out uh, how we're going to stop the, the growth of government, but how we're going to encourage more people to kind of enter and remain in the workforce so that we can help our small businesses uh, recover fully. Well, that's one thing that really doesn't get covered when you're looking at the loss of economic opportunities, the activity is the creation that never happens. You know, you, you, most organizations try to determine small business said, well, if I do this, I may have got here. But at the end of the day, you really can't get a exact idea of how much opportunity has been lost by the lack of businesses growing, the lack of opportunity, the lack of growth within the, the private sector. And, and when you can't do it here, those jobs either don't happen, they close down, or they go elsewhere in the case of some manufacturing. And those jobs don't come back, as you mentioned. Those jobs are lost and all the spinoffs are gone with them. People are making and businesses, global businesses are making investment decisions. They look at a country, they look at a labor force uh, availability metrics. Uh, we have one of the tightest labor markets ever. Uh, in many ways, that it's a good thing, right? People are still able to find work if they're looking for work. Um, the challenge is when you have bureaucracy and red tape and all these things getting in the way, these individuals and businesses are actually choosing to invest their money elsewhere. And so that is actually lost. You're right. That's lost forever. Uh, it's very hard to bring that investment back once a decision has been made. Uh, and that's ultimately going to hurt us in the long term because we actually need the private sector to be strong and flourishing and get back to 
uh, you know, where it should be, certainly in the tourism sector as an example, which is big in, in our ridings, uh, but in other parts too, both in technology and, and financial technology and manufacturing, um, we want to fight for those mandates to come to Canada. We don't want to keep continually losing them. And the government, I don't think, is being very uh, business friendly at this moment. I don't think they have for quite some time because don't forget, and I, I like to remind people, especially those who are tuning in for the first time, that from 2015 to 2019, during the Trudeau government's first majority parliament, they immediately started running the country on the credit card. They were already spending way above their means and really had no apologies for it. And, and they were told day in and day out, save for that rainy day because it will not always be good time. Sure enough, the pandemic hit and our fiscal capacity was hampered because they should have been paying off debt. They should have been storing away, ready for the bad times. You're exactly right, Jamie. The other thing I'd remind people is while they were spending, the government kept saying, interest rates are low. Don't worry, interest rates are low. We can afford this. Now we have interest rates increasing at a substantial pace and rate in order to get inflation under control. That means the cost of government borrowing, just like everybody else, is also going to increase. That means more money of every dollar is going to pay interest on the debt and not go to services that we need. And so the government's narrative is starting to crumble. Well, as mentioned, lots more money out there, not worth as much as it was before. And as people start to notice these increases, whether it be the grocery store, the fuel pump, you name it, everywhere across the supply chain, they make difficult decisions. And when they make those difficult decisions, it's usually the discretionary spending that goes first when they're looking at their budget, where they can cut back, where they can uh, try to make efficiencies in, in terms of their spending. It, it is the discretionary spending that goes first and that's the stuff you notice on the ground at the the the, the movies, the restaurants, you know, the, the some sports activities, the amusement parks, the fun stuff usually gets scaled back first. And 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 that's as you can see, I'm, I'm sure you're seeing it where you are. Um, people are talking about this is real. Look, people are delaying their trips. They're not taking their RV anymore on this summer vacation because they're worried about fuel prices. They're not talking about traveling because they're worried about the airports and actually coming back to Canada and making a flight on time and losing their luggage. They don't, maybe some of them have delayed uh, their travel because they don't have a passport yet. You know, we applied for my son's passport in March. We still don't have it. Uh, you've got people worried about the economic uh, future. They think that it's very uncertain. Most people now expect inflation to stick around for a little longer. And that's important because once inflation uh, embeds itself in terms of people's expectations, it can be very hard to bring back down. And uh, there's a very, uh, uh, a very well-known uh, uh, professor, uh, uh, they call him, he calls himself the food professor on Twitter, uh, follow him. We will be okay in terms of the amount of food that we have in Canada. It will be more expensive, but it's going to be nothing like the challenges that people in other parts of the world are going to feel. And we need to be very smart about food security. So when we talk about um, adding more regulations and rules on for farmers in terms of fertilizer and costs with the carbon tax. I mean, we've got to be realistic. The world is going to go through a global food shortage and we need to step up big, not uh, only just to help our people at home, but to make sure we can feed the world. That's actually a topic for a future discussion, actually. Uh, we're going to talk about what is going on in parts of Europe, how the government is playing in the marketplace and distorting the agriculture sector, especially in countries like the Netherlands, which are a huge exporter in agriculture, as well as what Canada is doing to its, its farmers right now with fertilizer and other uh, measures they say are for the common good. So, Adam, as you know, uh, we always give the guests the last, last word. Um, let's talk about what... Uh, the Conservative Party is proposing. Just to reiterate, I know we, you and, and many others have talked about it in Parliament over and over and over again. Um, but uh, you know, there's an, an article in the uh, Financial Post today by John Williamson, our colleague from New Brunswick Southwest, who talked about how the left loves rising gas prices, but now they're all of a sudden concerned about rising gas prices because they're actually 
hurting people's pocketbook. And it's not politically popular, but yet they've advocated for endless rules, regulations, and red tape in our oil and gas industry. They've championed the carbon tax. They've shut down pipelines, the ability for Canada to add to the supply shortage that is out there. But we have done this. The left has done this. And yet now they're saying, well, they're, let's tax them. Let's do something else because we so I'm not, Canadians are mad about this. And rightfully so. Well, and uh, you heard just yesterday the federal government talking about capping like a total cap on emissions for the oil and gas sector. I mean, someone's got to explain to Canada how capping our oil and gas uh, emissions is going to help the rest of the world decarbonize. If you just think about Alberta for a moment, Alberta moved from coal to natural gas. That is way cleaner for the world. Canada, with its massive natural gas reserves, could help countries like India and China in their transition from coal to natural gas as a midpoint until we eventually maybe get to some of the green uh, and renewable energy sources. But you know what, uh, Jamie, I'm one of all of the above guys. We need oil, we need natural gas, we need green, we need solar, we need all we need all kinds of sources of energy and Canada has a role to play in almost all of those energy sources. We can be an energy, a clean energy superpower which it respects the rule of law, respects democracy, respects human rights and respects the environment. Uh, the world should want more Canadian energy. We absolutely have to be there to provide it, but every single thing that this government has done since it's come in has left uh, a lot of people wondering if they're serious about our energy sector. And uh, as, a, as a closing comment, I think the one thing people need to be paying close attention to is this food security issue. You're gonna hear more about it. Um, we will be fortunate in Canada um, you know, it will be tough for a number of people, but around the world, it's going to be really tough. And the, and the, and the gentleman to follow is Dr. Sylvain Charlebois, a well-known uh, professor at Dalhousie, and uh, paints a very, very uh, difficult picture coming up. So maybe a future conversation, Jamie, we'll talk about uh, food. We can get our colleague on here, John Barlow, who's all about that, uh, all about that file and doing an excellent job. But it's, uh, I, I'm really worried about for what's to come uh, on the food security piece for, for us. I am too. And I think we'll have Barlow on or try to get him for uh, next week. Because I, I think you're right. That is a hot issue many people are starting to pay attention to. And those that aren't, we ask that you like, comment, subscribe, share this program to get together. We'll be able to get that, that word out. But at the same time, as we mentioned before, and I agree with you, Adam, our energy portfolio, that's the strategy for Canada should be A plus B, not taking away A, not just B, right? We should Absolutely. be adding, always adding, not just subtracting what the, the left wants to do. They just want to subtract oil and gas, rely on the renewals, renewables that aren't readily available. They're not affordable for the vast majority of Canadians. Until we get to that point, we need that oil and gas sector. Absolutely. Thank Thank you, Adam, for being there. Member of Parliament for Simcoe North, also the Deputy Shadow Minister for Finance. We appreciate his time. We appreciate your time. And we ask that you like, comment, subscribe, share this program with new content every single Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. If you haven't had the time to watch or listen to this entire program right this second, download it, listen to it on platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, you name it, it is out there. Until next week, we remind you, low taxes, less government, more freedom. That's the blueprint.